invite you this morning to open God's Word to the book of Matthew, chapter number 28. I read a story about a family who had received a postcard from a uh, relative who was visiting the Holy Lands. And as uh, the family was looking at this postcard, the little six-year-old girl, she says, I, I-, I wonder, Mom, do you think our-, our family saw the rose? The mom puzzled, looked, and she said, I- I'm not sure what you mean by the rose. The little six-year-old girl said to her mom, you know, it's, it's like the Bible women saw. They went to that garden where Jesus was buried and they saw that Christ had a rose. I want to tell you this morning, friends, I, I don't know if there were any roses at the tomb that morning. But I can tell you definitely, I can tell you definitively that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, if I was given that uh, response uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, that was about a one and a half. I want to tell you this morning that Jesus rose from the dead. You know, maybe the problem is, is that sometimes when we just simply say Jesus rose from the dead, we forget the rest of the story that makes that fact so incredible. You see, the Bible tells me that it was God in the flesh who came to this earth through the virgin-born Mary. God himself donned human flesh and became one of us. The Bible tells me that that perfect man, Jesus, lived a perfect life. The Bible says that he was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The Bible tells me that an innocent Jesus was nailed to a cross, and there he died. The Bible tells me that a lifeless Jesus was taken down off of the cross and buried in a tomb. But the Bible also tells me that a triumphant Jesus rose from the grave. Amen? You see, when you put the whole story together, uh, for lack of a better word, it becomes shout-worthy. I want to tell you this morning, friend, you may be saying, well, preacher, how can you be so sure? How are you so absolutely confident that Jesus came and lived and died and rose again? How do you know? I learned a song, although it wasn't exactly about this story, but I learned a life-changing song when I was a little guy in Sunday school. Let me tell you how I know Jesus rose, because the Bible tells me so. And I want to examine that passage this morning. Would you stand with me in order that we can reverence the Word of God and the God of the Word? Matthew chapter 28. I want to begin reading there at verse number one. God's word says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth forth uh, before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. Would you pray with me this morning? God, we do love you. We are so thankful, Lord God, that you left for us your word. Father, we we know that you love us. We know that you want us to spend eternity with you, God, and we're so thankful we don't have to guess how. But you left for us, written in your word, your plan of salvation. God, I know and I believe that you will always bless the reading of your word. But I ask this morning, God, would you bless the preaching of it. May your Holy Spirit just have free course and free reign in our hearts today. And may we be moldable as you lead. Ask in Jesus' name, Amen. You may be seated. So I want to tell you this morning. I believe that the the truth that Jesus rose from the grave is factually undeniable. There are skeptics and there are supposed scholars who have tried for two thousand years to prove that Jesus never really rose from the grave. And after 2,000 years of skeptics and scholars, there's a whole lot of theories, but no facts. 
You know, and to those that would say, well, preacher, I'm not really sure that this Jesus really rose from the grave or not. How do you really know that? Well, I, I, I can't spend all of our time this morning uh, explaining this, but I do have a few just very quick questions. Uh, if Jesus never really rose from the dead, if the body of Jesus was stolen, as some men have tried to, uh, to interject, then my question would be, who moved the stone? You see, there was a Roman temple guard, anywhere from 40 to, to 200 Roman soldiers sitting outside of here that someone to steal the body would have had to get through them. How did they get through them in the first place? This stone would have weighed about two tons. How would they have moved the stone? If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then who was it that appeared to the 12? Who was it that appeared to 500 on a later date? You see, the question this morning, friend, really cannot be, did Jesus raise from the dead? The question must be, what does that really mean for me? You see, factually, you can't deny the resurrection of Jesus or somebody somewhere would have come up with proof that he didn't. But you know why no one has any proof that he didn't raise from the dead? <laughs> because there is no proof he didn't because he did. What does that really mean? When you think about an empty tomb, the fact that Jesus died and arose again, what does that really mean for me in my life today? Friends, I want to tell you three things this morning. I want to tell you three things that we can know, three things that we can learn because Jesus rose from the grave. Number one, I'm going to go through these quickly. Uh, I know that you, some of you may not believe me, but I'm doing the best I can not to talk fast. This is kind of slow motion for me. Uh, but I want to encourage you. You put a seatbelt on this morning. I want, to, I want to show you these awesome things in God's Word. Notice number one, when we go back and look at Matthew 28, here's what it means to me. Here's what it means that the tomb is empty. It means that my sin is conquerable. It means that my sin is conquerable. Now, now there's some biblical principles you must understand to really understand what I'm saying. The Bible is so clear. The Bible is so plain that every one of us are sinners. Now, listen, we could take the time this morning to go one by one and make sure that we all understood we're sinners, but can we just suffice it to say that all of us understand we've sinned somewhere? You remember that one little white lie that you told a few uh, minutes ago? Yeah, the Bible says, uh, thou shalt not bear false witness. That means you can't lie. The Bible says that if you're guilty of one part of the law, you're guilty of all of it. The Bible makes it very plain, Romans 3, 23, that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Oh, by the way, I'll just uh, add this one in here. Uh, sometimes if I don't give a freebie every Sunday morning, I get in trouble with a couple of the young guys. So let me just throw a freebie in here. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we are a liar, and the truth is not in us. So can we just uh, uh, all agree today that every one of us are sinners? Then now, let me lay the hammer down for you. No, that's not biblical talk, but you know what I mean. Let me lay the hammer down for you this morning. According to the book of Romans, chapter 6, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. What we deserve because of our sin is death. But friends, that empty tomb changed things. No longer am I forced. No longer do I have to be conquered by my sin. But my sin can be conquered. How? Number one, through the person of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 5, we read in our text that the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek do you notice this, the, the proper name that is used here? I know ye seek Jesus. There have been other names that have used to refer to, to Jesus Christ throughout the New Testament. The Lord is one. Christ is one. But in this instance, this angel said, I know you seek Jesus. Why the name Jesus? I think it goes all the way back to the Virgin Mary. When the angel came to the Virgin Mary to announce the birth of Jesus Christ, the angel said to her that she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Automatically, the name Jesus would have been a reminder that this is the person who was sent by God to save us from our sins. John the Baptist, uh, in his ministry, identified the person of Jesus in John chapter 1 when he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. We read Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23, where the Bible told us that the wages of sin is death. 
Oh, but my favorite part of this verse is not the beginning, it's the end. For at the end of this verse, God's word says, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. How was my sin conquered? What did that empty tomb, how does that conquer my sin? Through the person of Jesus, but specifically through the payment of Jesus. You notice what he said there in verse number five, ye seek Jesus. You see that little line? which was crucified. Paul said in the book of Galatians, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Paul said in Romans chapter 5 that uh, he says, For if we were enemies, or when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. You understand that in order for our sin to be conquered, Jesus had to die. But did you know that Paul not only links the death of Jesus to our justification, to our right standing before God, Paul not only links the death of Jesus to our salvation, but he also links the resurrection. Listen to this, Romans 4 and verse 25, Paul says, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. You see, friends, here's what God's Word says. I want to try to keep this very plain, very simple. If Jesus would have died and stayed dead, he would be no different than any other prophet. But because Jesus arose, I can stand before God right. Because Jesus arose, my sin can be conquered. Maybe here's a word that you understand. Because Jesus arose, my sin can be forgiven. Listen, I want you to hear this. I know there were some of you that were here at 7 o'clock this morning for a sunrise service. And for those of you that were here, it's probably getting pretty close to nap time. But before you take a nap, I want you to hear this. There is no one that is so far gone, Jesus can't forgive. There is no one that is so broken, that Jesus' heart doesn't break. There is no addiction at all to the Almighty. There's no sin too grotesque for His grace. There is no crime that cannot be paid by Calvary. There is no sinner. I'm telling you, friends, that when Jesus rose from the grave, he made it possible that my sin could be conquered. Can I tell you a second thing this morning? What does that empty tomb really mean for me? It means that my sin is conquerable, but number two, it means that my Savior is coming. Now, I know some of you are saying, Preacher, how did you get from point A to point B? I want you to notice in Matthew 28 in our text, verse number 6, the angel says to the Marys, he says that he is not here, for he is risen. And I want to tell you, that statement in and of itself is fantastic. But did you catch this extra little phrase in the end? He is not here, he is risen, as he said. You know, this predates me just a little bit, but it's been said that one of the greatest home runs to have ever been hit in a Major League Baseball game was in a 1932 World Series game at Wrigley Field. You see, it was in this 1932 World Series game at Wrigley Field that Babe Ruth stepped up to the plate, pointed out in the, uh, in the, the grandstands, he called his shot, and then hit a ball exactly where he pointed. It wasn't the furthest home run that's ever been hit. It wasn't the, the grandest scale that a home run has ever been hit. But it is often referred to as the greatest home run. Why? Because he first predicted it and then did it. Friends, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus said in Matthew 16 uh, that from that time forth Jesus began to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed 
and be raised again the third day. In Matthew 17, Jesus says that the Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of men and they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised. Matthew chapter 20, uh, I think you're starting to get the point. Guess what Jesus said? The third day I will be raised. For lack of a better word, if you'll allow me to use it this way, Jesus pointed to the home run stands and said, in three days, I'm going to hit it out the park. And guess what he did? Hit it out the park. Hey, friends, Jesus said, I'm going to rise again. Three days, and he did it. Okay, well, preacher, what does that have to do with my Savior is coming? Because Jesus also said, In John chapter 14, that if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. That where I am, there ye may be also. The book of Acts records Jesus as uh, right before he ascended into heaven. The Bible says that he ascended and an angel said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner. Here's the reality. How can I stand here and tell you that that empty tomb proves to me that my Savior is coming? Because Jesus called it. He predicted it and then followed through. Friends, Jesus said he's coming back and we have every reason to believe that he will. Can I tell you a couple things about this second coming of Jesus? You know, when Jesus came the first time, humbly, Born of a virgin, wrapped in swaddling clothes, and laid in a manger. For lack of a better word, Jesus came in like a lamb in his first advent. The Bible tells us in his second advent, he's coming like a lion. Uh, in the Passion Week, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, which signified peace. In Judgment Week, Jesus comes back on a horse waging war against sin and Satan. I want to tell you, friends, that when Jesus comes, he's bringing judgment. When Jesus comes, he will serve justice. Those who know him as personal Savior will forever go to be with him. Those that deny him, Jesus said, I'll deny you before my Father. Apostle Peter preached that Jesus was coming again and people began to doubt. Here's what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3. He said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let me tell you what Peter's getting at. Listen, Jesus made a promise that I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be laid in a tomb, but three days later, I'm going to rise again. And he did. Jesus made a promise that I'm going to come again. And he will. Some would say, well, why hasn't he come already? According to Peter, he's given more people a chance to repent. I'm going to tell you, friends, Jesus is alive. Not only was he resurrected, but he is alive. And that means that my Savior is coming. But can I tell you, thirdly? Didn't tell me no, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Let me tell you thirdly, what does it mean that Jesus is alive? It means that my service is consequential. Now let me explain what I mean by that. That word consequential is a, is a word that, that means coming as a natural result. Uh, when I was growing up, if I was talking back to my dad, uh, there were some consequential actions. If I was talking to my dad, the natural result of that, if I was talking back to him, the natural result was uh, what one preacher termed intense fellowship. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, some of us know what I'm talking about. So what do I mean then when I say that, that because Jesus is alive, that my service should be consequential? What I'm saying is that because Jesus is alive, me serving him should be a natural result. Let me explain what I'm talking about. Notice verse number 6, the second half. The angel says, come, see the place where the Lord lay. Verse 7, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. This angel uh, uh, tells Mary, and Mary says, uh, 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 come and see 
And then he tells them to go. Now, that may not seem like that big of a deal, but put it in this terms. What did Mary and Mary wake up that morning intending to do? They had plans. They had it all planned out. The Bible says they were showing up at this tomb in order to finish properly burying Jesus. Aren't you glad the Lord's plans changed? Oh, it's okay to amen. I know sometimes we don't like it when the Lord has a different plan than ours, but uh, last time I checked, his plan's always been better than ours. Amen? So let me tell you, this is a good thing that their plans changed. They came here with one focus in mind, and their plans changed. I'll be completely honest with you. After researching all of the gospel accounts of this instance, I'm not 100% convinced that Mary and Mary had all of their questions answered. I, I got a feeling there were some things that they weren't sure about. There were some things that they didn't know about. This angel, all he told them was, I just need you to go and tell. I don't want you to notice verse number 8. They departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. The Bible makes it very plain. It, it, we're led to believe they didn't, they, they were scared. They didn't know all of the answers. They didn't know what was going to await for them. They just knew that their plans changed. The message came to them. The will of God said, I need you to go do this. And they did it. Why? Why did they obey? Why were they so willing to serve Jesus? I, I think it's because they believed that Jesus was who he said that he was. And they believed that Jesus did what he said he would do. Let me bring this home and make it personal for you this morning. When we understand who Jesus is, and when we begin to acknowledge and remember what Jesus did, serving him should be the natural result. See, I want to ask you, friend. Struggle serving Jesus I mean really truthfully uh, do we pat ourselves on the back and say well Jesus listen I woke up this morning I even combed my hair I put on uh, uh, some clothes that weren't dirty and I, and I walked into your house isn't that serving you doesn't seem like a whole lot compared to what he did for me I, I wonder sometimes you know Jesus said in fact you can keep reading in Matthew 28 Jesus told his church, go and make disciples. And how often do we ignore that command? Uh, Jesus, on the Mount of Olives, when he ascended in Acts chapter 1, says, go and be witnesses. By the way, in John chapter 13, Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. Get in that, preacher. The Bible tells us to be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Jesus said when he washed the feet of his disciples, I served you, now you go serve. I wonder, friend, when you struggle with serving Jesus, or when you stray from serving Jesus, when you just stop all together serving Jesus, what do you do? I believe we remember who Jesus is. We remember what Jesus did. See, when we reflect on Jesus, when we remember who he is, when we remember what he did, shouldn't our normal and consequential action just be, Lord, whatever it is you want me to do, like the prophet Isaiah said, here am I, Lord, you send me. Whatever it is, because of who you are and what you did, Jesus, I want to serve you. I want to close this morning with just a few thoughts. I've kept you just a few minutes longer than I wanted to. John Scott, an author, once said, We live and die. Christ died and lived. And I want to tell you this morning, as you leave this place, I want you to remember, number one, that Jesus arose. But remember, not only the fact that he rose from the grave, but the fact that he is alive today. What does that mean, that, that he arose and that he is alive? He can conquer your sin. The Bible says that if we will confess 
our sin, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The fact that Jesus is living today means he can conquer your sin. The fact that Jesus is living today, coming back. The question I have for you, Well, there's no denying the fact that Jesus is coming back. But your time to make a decision of whether you will accept Jesus Christ or reject Jesus Christ on this earth. I want to tell you thirdly, as our song leader and our musicians come, I want to tell you this morning that Jesus is a living Jesus. He's alive. That means we should serve him the way that he deserves. I don't know where you stand this morning. I don't know where you are between you and Jesus and your walk with him. Maybe you're a child of God who have become very selfish in your Christian life. And maybe you haven't been serving Jesus. Maybe you've been struggling, just surrendering yourself to him. I want to encourage you this morning. Remember who he is. Remember what he did. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus as your person. Maybe you didn't realize when you walked in here today that you're a sinner. Maybe you never knew that the punishment that your sin deserves is death. And maybe you never knew that Jesus offered to pay your sin debt for you. You might not have known those things when you came in here, but you can't leave here today and say, I didn't ever hear it. So maybe the Holy Spirit is working on your heart, and maybe today you say, I just want to respond to how God is moving me. I want to respond to God's word. That's what this is. We're about to offer an invitation. We're going to sing a, a verse of a song, and, uh, uh, and this is your opportunity to come. We've got uh, rooms to pray, uh, uh, areas to pray. I, I want to give you an opportunity this morning as you consider the fact that he is alive. I want to ask you to respond in any way that he might be leading you. Would you stand with me and let's say a prayer. God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you, Lord God, for your son Jesus.